Gaius Caninius Rebellus, Suffolk Consul, 45 BCE. A new man, Gaius Caninius Rebellus emerged on the historical scene as a military tribune in Caesar's Gallic War. Before his first year was over, Rebellus had been elevated to legate status. After performing well as the commander of the most critical section of the line during the Siege of Alesia, Rebellus became one of Caesar's most trusted associates. Over the next couple years, Rebellus continued to deliver solid performances. Unlike Caesar's most renowned legate, Titus Labinus, Rebellus decided to continue serving Caesar during the Civil War. Assigned as a legate to Africa under the command of Gaius Scribonius Curio, Rebellus played a part in one of the more notorious military debacles from this period. Our main account of Curio's campaign was penned by Caesar himself, and it is suspiciously reserved when it comes to describing Rebellus' role. Over the next few years, Rebellus continued to serve with Caesar and rise through the Curse of Sonorum, acting mostly, so far as we know, as a provisional detachment commander during the Second African and Munda campaigns. His record in these two operations is somewhat mixed. Finally, Rebellus's loyalty and service culminated in a Suffolk consulship in 45 BCE. In this video, we will discuss why Gaius Caninius Rebellus is the perfect paradigm of a Caesarian, to whatever extent that label has meaning. Finally, I will make the case that Rebellus is a very strong candidate for being the least significant consul in the entire history of the Roman Republic, although his overall career is relatively impressive. To the best of our knowledge, not a single one of Gaius Caninius Rebellus's ancestors had ever been a member of the Roman Senate. This makes him a novus homo in the purest sense of the term. Typically, new men could expect to achieve the first rank of the Senate, the keistership, which was not overly competitive since there were so many of them, and perhaps he could become one of the ten tribunes, and that would be just about it. It was very difficult for new men to really make their way. Men like Gaius Marius and Marcus Tullius Cicero were quite extraordinary insofar as they went in one generation all the way to the top of the Senate. In all likelihood, his family had been local grandees somewhere in Italy for many generations, and it was only in the time of Caninius Rebellus that he decided to leave his hometown and seek greater fame in Rome. And given how far he went in his career, he actually is the example of a success story. Maybe he's not as famous as Marius or Cicero, but still he did far better for himself than almost any other new man. Most likely his career began during the era of the first triumvirate, perhaps early on. We don't really know his office holding history in any kind of detail whatsoever. And he would have used his connections and pulled some strings to get an appointment to Gaul where he could hopefully win some fame and also really try to cultivate the friendship of Caesar, who by this time had become about equal to Pompey in terms of prestige after having been kind of the junior man in the triumvirate for the first few years. Due to Gaius Caninius Rebellus not being a very big name, we don't really know a whole lot about his early career as few people probably paid attention to the aspirations of yet another equestrian who wanted to make his way in the Senate. When we first see him in the historical record, he appears as a military tribune in Caesar's army in 52. By this time, the Gallic War is ramping up to its climax. This is when Caesar will have the largest army he'll ever command in Gaul of 10 full legions, and when he will fight the campaign that will culminate in the Battle of Alesia. After that point, it will be largely downhill. Military tribunes were, for all practical intents and purposes, staff officers, and most of them were young men with senatorial aspirations. Sometimes people tend to kind of romanticize the meritocracy of the Roman army and talk about how men could rise through the ranks, and that could kind of happen, but mostly only in the imperial period, and even then, that was the exception, not the rule. Even at the level of centurion, more of them were young men with greater ambitions as opposed to older men who had proven themselves. Normally, 
once a person served as a military tribune, they would follow that up by going back to Rome and running for the keistership. But in the case of Rebellus, he was actually elevated to be a legate instead and stayed with Caesar in camp. During the Gallic Wars, legates typically would command at least one legion and sometimes two or more. That being said, aside from Labinus, it was pretty rare for the other legates to command more than one at a time. Within half a year or so of his arrival, Rebellus seems to have impressed Caesar to the extent that Caesar gave him control of a single legion. That was a pretty rapid promotion given that he had only just arrived and there were plenty of people who had quite a bit more experience. And in the event, it, Caesar's judgment would prove correct as Rebellus would handle himself quite well. It was around the same time that Rebellus took up the reins of his legion that the grand uprising of Vercingetorix began. All of the remaining hostile tribes in Gaul rose up and rallying around the leadership of Vercingetorix at Alesia, they tried to cast out the Romans once and for all. However, Caesar moved quickly and laid siege to Vercingetorix before all of his forces could assemble. He was taken off guard, Vercingetorix was, and so his supplies were running low from the outset. However, a Gallic relief force came up and began to attack Caesar's lines. The normal practice in ancient war would be to abandon a siege, lest you be attacked on two sides. However, Caesar was very confident in the siege craft ability of the Romans and the lack thereof from the Gauls, so he decided to simply have a double line, one facing in both directions. This was a very risky strategy, but in the end, it would give him his most noteworthy victory. Rebellus would command a legion alongside of another military tribune or legate named Gaius Antistius Reginus, and the two of them together would hold a camp at a critical location on the southern slope surrounding Alesia. This was a position that both Caesar and Vercingetorix recognized as the most vulnerable point in Caesar's lines, and so the selection of these two men with their units meant that Caesar was deliberately putting these guys at the point where he knew a decision might happen. As 52 wore on and the Siege of Alesia continued to weaken Vercingetorix's garrison, he decided that he needed to make the main effort to break out since the relief effort from outside had not succeeded. And so he took the best of his remaining men and designated them as a strike force to hit at the southern slope, whereas his lesser formations would try to distract the Romans and prevent reinforcements. He knew that if he could break through at this point, he could link up with the other Gauls and the revolt would live on with him as the leader. However, this is where Rebellus was stationed and his men held firm in a desperate fight, which was only decided when Titus Labinus arrived with reinforcements. This was the day that really made Rebellus's career. He was now one of Caesar's golden boys. He had been tried sorely and he had come through. Caesar's gambit as a whole had paid off. He had cut the head off the snake, although this would not completely end the revolt. That being said, once Vercingetorix surrendered, the rebellion in Gaul would very much simmer down. And it would only be a matter of some admittedly large-scale mop-up operations over the next couple of years that would finish up the Gallic War. If you've ever read modern accounts of the Gallic War, they tend to end with Alesia simply because some of the operations that follow are not terribly compelling. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Caesar only bothered writing seven of the eight books himself about the Gallic Wars. Around this time, Caesar would formally elevate Rebellus to full legate status. He would single him out for independent command opportunities, and he would in the future entrust him with forces that would include more than a single legion. So while Rebellus was still not on the level of, say, Elevinus, he was now someone that Caesar trusted and would give quite a bit of command latitude to. The Great Revolt of Vercingetorix had brought in many Gallic tribes, including ones that had previously been allied with Caesar. And so in the spring of 51, on the heels of his great victory at Alesia, Caesar was eager to go and deal with these various tribes who had attempted to defy him.
Rebelus was to play a major role in this, as he was dispatched with two legions to pursue Lucterius, the leader of the Caderci. Lucterius fled to the Oppidum at Uxolodunum, and Rebelus began to lay siege there. The battle began to resemble Elysia, possibly because that was Rebelus's only real experience in terms of a siege, and he quickly found himself setting up lines trying to cut off the city and having to repulse sallies from the garrison. The stalemate was eventually broken when Caesar arrived with reinforcements. It's not entirely clear whether Rebelus required the help or whether Caesar had intended to arrive all along to conclude the matter more quickly so that he could move on to other trouble spots. Caesar did something here that was also rather uncharacteristic. Normally, he was generous to people he captured in battle, but in this case, he decided that he needed to send a message, and so he opted to cut off the hands of surrendered defenders as a deterrent to future rebellion. Whether this worked or not is hard to say, but Caesar seems to think that it did. After Elysia, the mop-up operations would actually take a full two years, and this is largely due to the large size of Gaul and the complexity of tribal politics. A good example of this is Rebelus's campaign in 50. In 50, Domnacus of the Andacavi actually had been partaking in what amounted to a civil war among the Pictones. He laid siege to the primary oppidum of Lamonum in western Gaul, which is on the Atlantic coast. An oppidum, by the way, is more of a fortified center used for defense and sometimes trade rather than a full-blown city in the Greek or Roman sense. At any rate, this was now under siege by Dumnacus, who was hostile to Caesar. The Pictones sent for aid, and Rebelus was dispatched. The internal conflict had started a couple years earlier, when 8,000 of the Pictones had actually gone to fight under Vercingetorix after several years of having been allies of the Romans. And from that point forward, once these men came home after the failure, they had been more or less in a state of civil war. Rebelus would lead a relief effort to save the city of Lamonum, and he would for first force the Andacavi to break the siege. As I mentioned, the normal way to deal with a relief effort is to pull out of your lines, face down the relief army in a field battle, and then resume your siege. So this is what Domnacus opted to do. However, Rebelus was able to defeat him pretty heavily, defeating upwards of 12,000 of his soldiers in battle. Whether these numbers are exaggerated or not is hard to say, as obviously the number under Dumnacus in this operation who fell exceeded significantly the number who had supposedly gone to fight at Elysia. Caesar later arrived in the area to help with further operations, but by the time he got there, the heavy fighting was over since Rebelus had already taken care of this. Also, it is worth mentioning that if the 12,000 number is accurate, then Rebelus would, in theory, be entitled to a triumph, or at least he would be if he held a senior magistracy such as a praetorship or consulship. Canoninus Rebelus peaked really hard in 50. He didn't know it, neither did Caesar, but that's what happened. Over the course of the year 50, relations between Caesar and Pompey broke down. Caesar actually spent quite a bit of his time in Cisalpine Gaul in order to try to negotiate something with Pompey, but all of his efforts failed. And so when war broke out in early 49, Rebelus was firmly with Caesar, and he would remain with Caesar for the entirety of the Civil War. We know that his legions were almost certainly relocated to Cisalpine Gaul because he was present there, and as a senior commander, he would not have been the kind of guy who would have just been transferred willy-nilly since his services were rather valuable. There's a pretty good chance that he was in command of one or more of the legions that were designated for the invasion of Italy. But since Caesar was present in person and the operations were mostly fairly small scale, we don't really get any details from Caesar about who did what during those operations. The only people he really mentions by name and in any detail are the commanders opposing him, such as Publius Adius Varus and the former consul Domitius Ahenobarbus. What 
Rebelus did do that made the record, however, was to serve as one of the chief negotiators sent to deal with Pompey at Brundisium. This was right before Pompey finally withdrew from Italy altogether, so Rebelus was sent in as kind of a last-ditch effort. Perhaps Caesar thought that if he sent in a plain-spoken new man, someone who had made his name and who had a good reputation as a hard fighter, that maybe Pompey would be more likely to respect this guy who would just say what's on his mind rather than trying to play some sort of complex political game. But that ultimately didn't quite pan out either. Just like all the earlier efforts, Rebelus's uh, attempt to make peace with Pompey failed. The Spring 49 campaign was a smashing success for Caesar as he not only routed all of Pompey's forces, but even managed to get some of the newly raised legions to sign up with him. He also managed to capture the treasury and had some other good moments. That being said, his overall strategic picture was still not ideal. Pompey was about to raise a large army in the east, and there were also potential threats in the south and the west. Perhaps the biggest threat of all was in Spain, where Pompey had about four legions. He also had two of his most senior and trusted lieutenants there, Petrius and Afranius. So Caesar knew that he personally needed to go and deal with those legions and secure his rear before he went after Pompey. He famously quipped that he went after the army without a general rather than the general without an army, which was a subtle way to try to take shots at the generalship of Afranius and Petrius, who up to that point had been pretty competent. Of course, they would get smashed by Caesar, but that was pretty much par for the course. As far as his second largest operation, this would actually be entrusted to a former tribune named Gaius Scribonius Curio, a man who had little known military experience and who was not exactly a dyed-in-the-wool Caesarian. Curio was someone who had actually been very critical of Caesar for the entirety of the First Triumvirate. However, Curio hated Pompey even more, and his opposition to Pompey and his insistence that all of the measures being taken against Caesar or being proposed against Caesar be applied to Pompey had really alienated the Optimates. So Curio more or less had fled the Caesar's camp for safety, and Caesar was eager to put this young, talented man to work and to take advantage of his reputation as sort of a political actor who was not beholden to Caesar, and to really make the most of that in order to persuade others that siding with Caesar was honorable. So that leaves the issue of, well, if you're entrusting a large effort to Curio, who doesn't really have much military experience, how do you ensure that he will be successful? Well, you can attach someone to him who's experienced, and so the job of shoring up the political appointee fell to Caninius Rebelus. So he was attached to Curio as a legate, and he may have had a dual role, both to advise on military matters, which we know that he did, and perhaps also to guarantee Curio's loyalty. After all, Curio had been, as I mentioned, a strident critic of Caesar for most of the last decade. So Rebelus found himself in a somewhat awkward position, as he was not in charge, but he was expected to bring about victory. Caesar does not furnish a ton of detail about the subordinate commanders in Curio's army. So we don't know all that much about Quintus Martius Rufus, and we also don't know all that much about Caninius Rebelus. We often hear of Rebelus either staying in command at camp while Curio went out with the cavalry or being in the command tent offering advice, but we don't have any kind of detailed blow-for-blow -blow account of Rebelus's doings. However, there is one incident where Rebelus really shined and where we can see that he was someone that Caesar really respected and also probably someone who told Caesar about the campaign low-key. Um, the most exciting event, perhaps the apogee of Curio's campaign, at least from the Caesarian perspective, is after having won a few skirmishes against Adius Varus and his Numidian allies, the two generals were about to square off near Utica. And the two armies were separated by a ditch or a great depression that would require one army to cross and then come up a steep slope to attack the other. So because of the tactical disadvantage that you would incur 
by having to clamber up broken ground at a steep angle and then potentially have an enemy army charge straight down into you. Neither general wanted to be the one to commit first. So the armies stood and watched each other until Adius made the first move. And this was a limited probe, but it did show that the generals have been wise to be weary of this ditch. So Adius sent his men in first, and Curio countered. The Pompeian men were routed, and both commanders didn't really know what to do at that moment. Curio still thought that this had not been enough to shatter the morale of the Pompeians, but Rebelus said that the enemy were shaken, and that he needed to strike now, and that if he struck now, the boldness of it would rout the enemy force. Curio was convinced. He was naturally a bit on the aggressive side. And so, despite a rather awkward crossing of this difficult terrain, Curio's men were able to get through the ditch and up the other side, and the enemy didn't even wait for them to arrive, but rather broke and fled. And once again, I have to highlight the rather low quality of Civil War armies. These were hastily raised formations, most of them did not have that much combat experience, and Curio's own forces were not the best men in Caesar's army, it's worth pointing out, because at least one of the legions that he took with him to Africa had been raised by the Pompeians and then had surrendered to Caesar in 49. So it was a unit that had been hastily raised and trained and had switched sides just that same year. Yet they clearly were out fighting the Pompeians in Africa. When I read Caesar's second book of the Commentaries on the Civil War, I noticed that despite his seniority and despite the trust that Caesar had in him, Rebelus's name is conspicuous only by its absence. Rebelus does not appear nearly enough given how much trust Caesar claims to place in the man and the kind of favoritism that Caesar showed him before and after Curio's campaign. So that led me to think why is Rebelus not featured more prominently in this campaign, and why is he not assessed any blame for its failure? The best example of this is how, during the fateful Battle of the Bagratus, where uh, Curio was encircled and destroyed by Juba and the Numidians, Rebelus isn't mentioned. Now, this is odd because there were a total of 20 cohorts deployed in Africa at the time, Fifteen of them were under Curio, along with his cavalry. And so you would think that if Martius Rufus was back in the camp, this would mean that the other senior commander would be helping Curio. Yet, we don't hear about Rebelus. So either he fought and escaped at the Bagratus, which one thinks would be brought up, but it wasn't, or else he was somewhere else. Well, what if he was back in the camp at Castra Cornelia? What if he and Curio didn't get along very well because he thought that Curio was too aggressive? Um, we know that in previous parts of the campaign, he was usually the guy left in camp. So it's kind of odd that that responsibility would now shift to the relatively inexperienced keister, uh, Martius Rufus. But when the news of the disaster at the Bagratus arrived at camp, it was apparently the keister Martius Rufus who was left trying to deal with the men's panic and failing to do so. And so Caesar doesn't directly say that Martius Rufus bungled the situation, but he does make it clear that he was supposed to be the man on the spot and that things went to shit. So where was Rebelus? Well, it's possible, I would say, that he had been sent back to Sicily to fetch the other two legions and cross with them because Curio and his commanders had decided that they would need to bring the other half of the army. Speaking of the other half of the army, Caesar, in his account of the early campaign decisions by Curio, makes it clear that he thinks that Curio blundered in the beginning by not taking the other half of the army. But again, uh, where was Rebelus in all this? Did he give that piece of advice that was ignored? So, again... It seems to me that Rebelus must have been whispering in the Caesar's ear while he wrote this account, and that Caesar had a somewhat favorable portrayal of Curio for political reasons, but ultimately thought that Curio had bungled because he didn't listen to Rebelus.
Now, my suspicion is that he wanted to humor Rebelus by giving him credit for the great victory at Utica, but at the same time, uh, he maybe thought that Rebelus was exaggerating his own role and claiming a level of genius that Caesar knew from firsthand experience Rebelus did not actually possess, even if he was a perfectly competent commander in most respects. We don't know exactly what Rebelus did after he left Africa. Clearly, he survived the campaign, and he continued to serve Caesar. Most likely, he spent some time back in Rome as a praetor or holding some other office, because as we'll see, he had to be eligible for the consulship by 45. At any rate, um, he was back in Africa by 46. He was present at the Battle of Thapsus. He most likely took part in the fighting and advised Caesar, perhaps commanding some part of the line. Later on, after Caesar smashed Scipio's army, the city of Thapsus itself shut its gates and refused to surrender. Caesar had fully expected that the governor of Africa, Gaius Virgilius, would surrender the city after he saw that the army was shattered and the cause was lost but Virgilius decided to hold on to hope. After all, there were more senatorial forces in Africa that could potentially rally. And so Caesar tried to intimidate him by parading the captured elephants in front of the city, and then he ostentatiously handed out decorations of valor for the battle before he led his main force off in pursuit of the fleeing forces of the Pompeians and Numidians. Meanwhile, Caninius Rebelus was left in charge of three legions and asked to besiege Thapsus. Even if potentially Caesar's faith in Rebelus had been shaken a bit by the first African campaign, he knew that Rebelus knew his way around a siege. After all, that was literally what put his name on the map. But ultimately, it wouldn't be Rebelus's siege skills that would decide the issue at Thapsus because Virgilius was holding out hope that Cato and Utica would rally the defeated army and turn things around, and he thought that he could tie up part of Caesar's army by refusing to surrender Thapsus. But Cato, when he heard the news of the battle, decided that he had lived too long for this world, and that he did not wish to live any longer in a world where the Republic no longer existed. So Cato took his own life. Meanwhile, Juba's chief general, Sabura, who was one of the main commanders at the famous Battle of the Bagratus, was completely crushed by the mercenary captain Publius Cedius, who had sided with Caesar, and Juba, for his part, had lost all hope that the cause would revitalize, so he was wandering around like a broken man, mumbling to himself, and when the news of all these things reached Virgilius, he decided that all was lost, and it was best to save himself and his family. And so he began to negotiate with Rebelus, who was able to guarantee the safety of his family and person, and Thapsus changed hands successfully and peacefully without a violent sack. So all ended well, and once again, Rebelus did his duty in a competent, if unspectacular, fashion. The following year in 45, Rebelus accompanied Caesar to Spain and partook in the Munda campaign. Ancient writers agree that this was the most hard-fought and closely contested campaign of Caesar's career, and certainly of the Civil War. Munda itself was fought pretty early in this campaign in March or so, and this was of course against Caesar's old comrade Titus Labinus, and that might account for why the battle was such a closely fought contest, as Labinus was very familiar with Caesar's generalship and was a fine commander in his own right. During the follow-up to Munda, Rebelus was once again employed as someone who would do a relatively minor task on behalf of the dictator. The city of Hispalus surrendered, and the population was still divided about the decision to surrender, so Rebelus was sent in with a garrison in order to keep order. However, the account written by one of Caesar's unknown subordinates doesn't make clear whether Rebelus stayed with the garrison or whether he simply installed the garrison and then left. This is important because some of the locals who were discontented managed to escape 
to recruit help from the countryside, and then they came back under the cover of night, retook the city, butchered the garrison, and created more problems that Caesar had to resolve. Most of the men who Rebelus had installed were massacred, but clearly, whether because he hadn't stayed in the first place or because he was a resourceful and clever man, he managed to make his way out, and by the end of the year, we know for a fact that he was back in Rome. So up to this point, Rebelus had been one of the most loyal people to Caesar, and he had served by his side in some very hotly contested battles, from Alicia to Munda. In 45, Caesar arranged for there to be four different men holding the consulship. He had plenty of followers to reward, and only so much time. So for the first half of the year, there were two consuls, and then two Suffolk consuls took over in the middle of the year. Gaius Trebonius was one of them, and the other was Quintus Fabius Maximus. Fabius had been present in Spain for the Munda campaign, and it had apparently exacerbated his existing health problems. So he had been ill for months, and in the middle of the day on December 31st, he keeled over. Now, normally, this office would be left unfilled if there was a consul designate who would take the office the next day anyway. And normally, that would be what would happen. But Caesar decided that this office could be filled by his old friend and loyal ally, Gaius Caninius Rebelus. And so, for the remainder of December 31st, Caninius Rebelus was Suffolk Consul alongside of his fellow Caesarian, Gaius Trebonius. So that leads to the question of why Caesar bothered to fill the office for just one night. Well, the simple truth is, as I alluded to earlier, he had many people he needed to reward, and there were also people who had opposed him that he wished to appease. Caesar wanted to make sure that people had a reason to want him to continue as the first man in Roman politics. He wanted Rome to be placid while he went east to deal with the Parthians. And because Caesar was getting up in years and his epilepsy was getting worse, there's every reason to think that he would die in Parthia, or not too long thereafter, and so he wasn't all that worried about the distant future. He just wanted to make sure that the people who had helped him were in a position to carry on his legacy, and he possibly assumed that the Republic would continue. After all, so far as we can tell, he didn't really envision himself as founding any kind of dynasty. That being said, there's also little evidence that he ever intended to go back to, uh, go back to being just one of the members of the Senate. So rewarding Caninius Rebelus was a way to put another consular in the Senate who would be a voice and a vote even though there was not enough time to give him a formal consulship that was worthy of the name. So this was something that was easily mocked and drew quite a bit of derision, yet it was a real achievement. Technically speaking, Gaius Caninius Rebelus was now a consular for the rest of his life. So he was among the first men to speak in every meeting of the Senate. And had Caesar lived longer, his relationship with Caesar would mean that he still would be taken seriously even though his consulship was a bit of a joke. So why was he not in the regular rotation? Because Caesar had assigned appointment, uh, the appointments of high offices for several years in advance. And the reason why Caninius Rebelus didn't make the cut is simply because, well, he was not as important as many of the other members of even the Caesarian faction. Trebonius and Fabius Maximus, for instance, were more prominent. There were also men to consider like Herdius and Panza, who had also given good service, but done so for longer. And of course, there was the rising star and kinsman of Caesar, Mark Antony. So there were plenty of people Caesar needed to reward for their service. Uh, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus is another one, who took precedence over Rebula, uh, Rebulus. And so he was consul for literally one night only. And as you might imagine, there was a lot of derision, and at the forefront of any derision directed at Caesar was, of course, Marcus Tullius Cicero, the great orator and consummate smartass. He quipped about Caninius's consulship. Understand, therefore, that in the consulship of Caninius, no one breakfasted. <laughs> 
However, while he was consul, there was no harm done, for he was so astonishingly vigilant that throughout his consulship he never even closed his eyes. While it is demonstrably an oversimplification, the fact remains that the perception was that new men went with Caesar and that established names went with Pompey. And because there is some truth in that oversimplification, Gaius Caninius Rebellus is a very good example of a prototypical Caesarian. He was a new man. He owed his entire political career to the patronage of Julius Caesar and to his performance on the battlefield. He was a competent soldier who did right by Caesar. He was loyal to him in many different campaigns, including some very stiff contests such as Alicia and Munda. Overall, Caninius Rebellus was a generally successful commander, although he does seem to have been somewhat limited. He was at his best in a hard fight, but maybe not the best option if you needed somebody to make strategic decisions or to figure out a complex uh, problem. Even though Caesar was far more flexible than his opponents, Caninius Rebellus's limited clout and pedigree did limit his options. Because the Senate simply would not accept just anyone in the highest offices in the land unless they had something to offer. And while we don't really know anything about Caninius Rebellus's performance in Rome as a politician, the fact that we don't know anything implies that either he was not very politically adept or that he never really had the opportunity to shine because he was always so busy serving on Caesar's staff or commanding legions. What's also interesting about Rebellus and what makes him a kind of, I guess, typical Caesarian is that we don't know enough about him to know the complexities of his person or character. We learn a lot about a number of Caesarians when they're forced to choose between the assassins and the other Caesarians or between the various Caesarians after the assassins are defeated. But with Caninius Rebellus, we actually have no idea what happens to him after he's consul for the day. He may very well have died in the civil wars that followed the Ides of March, or perhaps he died suddenly before that. Or maybe more intriguingly, he decided to go the route of the historian Sallust and declare neutrality and sit out the entirety of the second round of civil wars. However, the sacrifices that he made on the battlefield and the risk that he ran for Caesar ultimately did bear fruit because not only did he get a consulship, but his son and namesake also got one many years later under the patronage of Caesar's heir, Augustus. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian, and we will continue to look at figures from this period.